thank you everyone very much for attending the first Center for Health Economics and Policy Studies uh, seminar series uh, event. We're thrilled to have you all here at the beginning of the semester. Uh, a, a couple of administrative notes is that we've got our most recent edition of CHEPS magazine out in front of you for those at the table that can read about uh, some of the accomplishments of the center uh, over the course of the last year. And you have the uh, list of the great fall seminar series speakers that are going to be uh, coming throughout the next few months. Uh, before we begin with Scott, uh, I want to uh, recognize and introduce the uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Letters, uh, Glenn McClish, who has uh, joined us here today. Glenn, please. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to see all this student energy here. It's uh, really nice to fill the place up and then some students, faculty. I'm very impressed by the work of the center and the list of speakers is very, 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 uh, very impressive. So um, we're grateful for the work you do. And, uh, we're very glad to have you up here on the sixth floor. And um, I look forward to the seminar today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenn. I appreciate it. Uh, today we have the privilege of having Scott Cunningham join us. Uh, Scott is an applied economist from Baylor University. Uh, he has done work in the economics of crime and is known for a lot of his work on the economics of, of sex workers and the impact of, of public policies on risky behaviors. Uh, Scott has published in some of the top journals in the field, including the Review of Economic Studies, the Journal of Public Economics, uh, Journal of Human Resources and Health Economics, and we're very fortunate to and have him here today. And the Review of Economics of the Household. <laughs> <laughs> and we're very fortunate to have Scott here uh, today to discuss some of his work on uh, Craigslist uh, online erotic services and violence against women. Scott, thanks so much for coming. Thanks, Joe. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is with my co-author Greg D'Angelo, who's at Claremont Graduate University, and John Tripp that's at Clemson. So um, on Twitter, uh, there everybody got on my case because it used to be called uh, Did. Craigslist reduced violence against women and all these people said that economics articles just should say exactly what the paper's about. <laughs> so uh, I just said, you know what, I'm not going to hide it, this is what we find. So, um, so a little bit about uh, the background for this study. Um, so a lot of my research has actually focused on technology and its effect on sex work. I've written on public policy but I started studying sex work because I was inter interested in how the internet was reorganizing the market. So, um, but uh, with a little bit of background to sex work, it, it's, it's correlated with a lot of very bad outcomes. It's, you know, the workers are much more likely to have ever been victimized uh, by, a, by a man in any way whatsoever. They come from abusive backgrounds lots of times. They have much higher rates of STDs and they've experienced other kinds of harms like, and even self-harm through substance abuse and things like that. So it's a, it's a vulnerable group of women. It's women and men, but um, I'll be primarily focusing on the heterosexual sex work. And work that I've done um, with Todd Kendall has noted that the internet kind of when it came along, it wasn't just simply like a new tool that uh, could be used by sex workers. It really just reshaped the market altogether um, and did this through reducing uh, search costs, reducing risks of arrest, and then creating these platforms that helped facilitate the market. Um, uh, so the sex workers, when you speak to them anecdotally, and of course you're only speaking with survivors and so they're you know you don't know what you're getting but when you do speak to them or you read their writings they say that the internet made them safer now you obviously are not speaking with anyone that perished because of the um and if the internet affected them but you've got these speakers and they say that it made them safer but to date no one has actually ever evaluated their claims uh because for whatever reason, they haven't, so this is the first paper, to my knowledge, that's done it in the way that an economist uh, considers evaluation. Okay, so, um, so here's sort of the, the punchline. This is what I'm going to try to uh, argue today is evidence. Okay, I've backed off. I'm not going to say I know these are effects are true. I'm going to present you with all this evidence that I think is compelling. And that is that uh, Craigslist erotic services lowered female homicide rates 
by anywhere from 10 to 17 percent. Um, I have attempted to try to figure out what the mechanism would be. Why would it do that? Um, I'll tell you why I think that it is happening, but the only evidence that I have is uh, I, can, I do have evidence that it is appearing to reduce street prostitution and moving those women indoors. And so I think that it's, it's at least possible that the main mechanism by which it's reducing homicides could be that it's removing these highest risk women from their highest risk environments. But I throw out some other ideas too. There could be some sort of weird disruption uh, that's happening that's hard to, that I don't understand what it is yet. There could be some kind of substitution that's going on between violent men and commercial sex work that we don't fully understand. Or it could be that the internet is allowing these women to screen their clients more effectively, even if I can't find evidence for that. Homicide rates for female sex workers. This mm -hmm. is the homicide rate for it's the total female, female homicide rate. Yeah, it's the total female. It could be just sex workers, but my measure is total female homicide. Sure, but if you think about you know, this coming through female sex workers, female sex workers in the population. Yeah, these are, are quite large magnitudes. Yeah, they're big numbers. You sound like one of my referees. <laughs> 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 Violence against sex workers, and, and even I know you can't you can't measure the supplemental hom homicide yeah. reports or the occupation of the person. But what what even anecdotally, anything sort of descriptively, do we know about rates of violence against sex workers that might lead us to believe that? All right, so uh, it is the single most dangerous job in the United States for a woman. So uh, before the internet, female sex worker workplace homicide rate was 204 per 100,000. Second most dangerous workplace homicide profession was the female liquor store employee where it was four per 100,000. Uh, homicide rate, another study finds homicide rate for the street prostitute prior to the internet was 13 times higher than the general population. Um, they're hunted by serial killers. 65% uh, of all serial murders victims are females. And of those females, 78% are sex workers. 35% of all sex worker homicides were by serial killers, all of which is to say it is a very dangerous profession. They are vulnerable women and men, but the, I'm looking at the women. They're a very vulnerable group of women because they are disenfranchised. They are no longer, they no longer are, probably have very good social connections anymore. They're oftentimes runaways. They're living in the street. Nobody's gonna notice that they're missing. Right. That's why there's such great prey for these violent men is because there's a better chance you're going to go away with it. So in terms of this being a historically dangerous profession and it being connected to the street markets does help provide some plausibility to the results. The effect is how many women are sex workers and could you sort of like, you know, back out you know, are these reasonable estimates in that sense? And that part, I don't know. There's uh, one study that finds, and I just now lapsed my, I was gonna say 204. I think it's 23 full-time equivalent sex workers per 100,000 women or something like that. So th there's like one study that that site gets repeated over and over. We just don't really know very much. Um, this is the problem of studying the illicit market is just getting that kind of data. But we do know these women face very high risks of homicide. So, um, so a little bit about how I think about prostitution. Um, I think about it in terms of a two-sided matching market. So the, the thing about uh, sex work is it's illegal in pretty much everywhere in the United States except for the rural counties of Nevada. And uh, that creates a problem for a market because buyers don't know who the sellers are, sellers don't know who the buyers are. So you, you know, a man cannot just go up to a random woman on the street and make an offer. He will get in trouble for that. And a woman can't just go up to a man on the street and make an offer to him. It just doesn't work that way, not in the United States. So, so there's one way of framing that is just that there's tremendous search costs tremendous amounts of uncertainty. And uh, what Craigslist did is it was the first platform that significantly addressed those 
search costs. And it did it because there was this 1996 Communications Decency Act uh, that provided infrastructure to the illicit market that solved all these problems. I'm just going to tell you briefly about it because if you don't understand the 96 Communications Decency Act, then you're left with, you know, how is it possible that Craigslist was actually opening, openly doing this stuff. So the CDA, Communications Decency Act, what it basically did was it made a website responsible for anybody that transmitted obscene materials. Uh, it was really targeted at youth. This is you know, a very traditional kind of thing. Conservatives are very concerned about the use of media that could be used to harm uh, young people. But the problem was that the, the problem here is the First Amendment uh, basically uh, made that unconstitutional. And so in Reno versus ACLU, it said the Communications Decency Act lacks the precision that the First Amendment requires when a statute regulates content or speech, which meant that this portion of the CDA got struck. So without that, so it's kind of funny, it's called the Communications Decency Act because of this that got cut, the decency part got cut. So all that was left of relevance was Section 230 of the CDA. And Section 230, you have to kind of keep in mind, it's like this was a constrained optimization kind of problem. It was like, this will be the constraint, and then this will be the free provision of the internet to the rest of the world. So here was what they did for everybody else, excluding this obscene content. It said, no provider or user of a website shall be treated as the publisher of any of the information that was published on that, which meant that if you and I went into the New York Times comments section and started calling each other really liable names, uh, the New York Times is not responsible. The New York Times is not considered the publisher of any of that content by the third party, which means that the, the, third, which means that the New York Times can offer that without any kind of liability. Okay? So Craigslist provides erotic services legally. And courts repeatedly backed Craigslist and Backpage, citing Section 230 of the CDA. It was completely legal for these websites to exist, even though they were openly facilitating illicit exchange. Okay? So after, shortly after 96, you start seeing, with the growth of the internet, all these websites. Two types of websites relevant to this study. There's the review boards. We're going to use both of them. There's the review boards, which are like Yelp. TripAdvisor, um, the Erotic Review, was a client-based review website where clients of sex workers would go into the Erotic Review and fill out detailed information about the sex workers that they had seen. That was a review website because they would leave reviews and ratings. So these were, uh, this was part of that, you think about it as like Internet 2.0, it's like the reputation system and how the reputation system emerged to sort of facilitate some of these contracts. And then there was the advertising section, the advertising sites. And these were not clients, these were the sellers. So this is the buyers, or the, you know, the clients. They are the ones that leave reviews. And sex workers leave ads. It's the two sides of the market. And uh, Craigslist was one of them. Okay? Now there had always been, in print media, back pages, in the alternative newspapers. Craigslist comes in and just decimates classified ad print at classified advertising. That is known uh, across the board, but they also decimated the back pages of the alternative newspapers, uh, and they absorbed a lot of that. So you know, it was very different. What, what made Craigslist kind of different, what made Craigslist so nice, it was A, it was free, and uh, it could be updated daily, right? Whereas the, uh, the back pages of some alternative newspaper like Village Voice or the Providence Phoenix, that was updated on a weekly or monthly basis and would run and then was very expensive, no photographs, not a lot of information. Uh, this was just anybody could throw up anything, right? So Craigslist shuts down erotic services in 2010 uh, under extreme, extreme pressure from law enforcement, even though it's legal. Law enforcement is harassing Craigslist constantly. State attorney generals, activists, they're getting a very bad name. And this isn't even their day, you know, erotic services isn't even how they pay the bills. They pay the bills from housing and from job postings. But everything else is free. So this was harming them. So they shut it down and Backpage, I'll show you in a minute, immediately picks it up. So I say all this 
you know, um, you're supposed to, and these applied micropapers only speak to what you can speak to. But um, I wanted to just mention this uh, because in spring 2018, Trump passed the FOSTA-SESTA legislation, probably will be the single most popular uh, legislation he'll ever sign. It passed the Senate 97 to 2. Um, it removed all the Communications Decency Act loopholes. So now, in the United States, uh, you are liable for the transmit, if you knowingly, uh, if the website knowingly facilitates sex trafficking or prostitution, they are now liable. Immediately, all the websites shut down. Um, Backpage got seized by the DOJ. Its executives are under indictment. All right. So Craigslist, let me tell you a little bit about Craigslist. Uh, it's 15th most popular website in the United States. Offers cheap advertising, very much better matching, uh, more business, and lower search costs. So lots of studies on this. Uh, it's been very, it's had very large impacts on uh, brick and mortar businesses. Erotic services was a very low cost advertising section of the website. It initially was free, uh, under pressure from attorney generals. Uh, and from law enforcement, they raised the price to $5 and $10 a post. They did that because they thought that they could deter some of those postings if you had to price for it. Uh, instead, they just made tens of millions of dollars from it. So um, that it didn't, you know, there was reductions. It was probably reducing a lot of repeat posting, but uh, still very popular. Um, they provided it until 2009. They shut it down due to intense harassment from attorney generals and activists. So I wanted to just show you the impact that the shutdown had, just so you can kind of have a sense of how these platforms work. So the first thing I did was a while back, I was hand collecting all of this uh, advertising data at, the Cra at Craigslist Erotic Services. There was actually two events that happened at Craigslist. The first event was they shut down Erotic Services in May of 09 and opened something called adult services. All that it was was it was staffed. They censored more of the ads and they had about 10 people. Back, I mean, Craigslist is a lean company. You know, they do no advertising. They have like 10 employees. So they probably doubled their staff just to staff adult services. Uh, and when they did that, I was actually also collecting data on Backpage at the time. And you can see Backpage's erotic services, this was Craigslist erotic services, this at the national level, it just was not really used. But then when they did adult services, first you can see adult services takes off, okay? It never replaces the previous business, but Backpage also suddenly appears. That's the challenge of regulating these two-sided platforms is that insofar as there is a substitute that can absorb a lot of that, matching, you know, it, it can push it to the next platform, right? So here's data I got from the Erotic Review, which is that review website I told you about. And what's nice about the Erotic Review is that clients leave these detailed essays about the women. So all I did was I went through and I just looked at when the word Craigslist and Backpage appeared in, a, in one of their essays. And you can see actually what's kind of interesting is that Craigslist was, you know, weirdly enough, it was already kind of declining. Now, it does look like it drops a little bit steeper, but with the adult services intervention, it continues its decline until it gets to the shutdown of erotic services, in which case, for some reason, it still gets mentioned, but not as much. But you can see right here, when they did the self-censoring adult services, immediately Backpage jumps up and just explodes. So this is where people are always like, well, why don't you look at Backpage? Why don't you look at the effect of it? The problem is I don't really have a lot of, ge I don't have any geographic variation in Backpage, and uh, uh, the substitutability of Backpage, you know, the shutdown of Backpage and all these other things, it's not as straightforward to study as it might look like. They're these things, insofar as those other platforms. All right, so here's what Erotic Services did. Reduce the search costs for buyers, reduce the advertising costs for sellers, created a more efficient market efficiency in the sense that these matches could better take place. Probably thickened the online market. I can show that it definitely increased the number of ads, or the number of reviews. Probably did it through two margins. First, Craigslist probably moved street workers indoors. We get the sense of that anecdotally, and I've published some papers that sort of suggest that too. But it probably also affected it at the extensive margin. Some women entered the market because the probability of detection went almost to zero 
probability of rest went almost to zero, and allegedly it made them safer. They didn't have to work with a pimp. And so you would expect some woman, depending on the size of the mass of people at the extensive margin, what those elasticities are, some women would enter. Who These are counterfactual, never, they would have never been a sex worker. Right? These are always sex workers, and these are like our compliers. Right? And so we expect that some people probably entered the market who wouldn't have otherwise been a sex worker. Um, and allegedly, uh, the, thing that, the thing that's, you know, I think that's really important about erotic services is it also allowed the woman to collect information about the client. All right? So uh, in the street, she has no time to collect any information. She just makes a split second decision. But online, she has time and she has tools. So I wanted to sort of show you what I think are probably the preference ordering of every sex worker, if I had to imagine. This is the preference ordering of every sex worker over the four types of clients that she could ever meet with. The number one person that the sex worker wants to meet with is a client who shows up on time and pays, right? Because there's an opportunity cost to that slot of time that she slotted him in. So she definitely wants him to show up and she wants him to pay like he agreed to pay. Right? You do that, that's the best case scenario. That's the whole reason she's doing it. Okay? Secondly, after that, she would like to match with a client who doesn't show up or is unprofessional. Right? I mean, obviously, she, this, is, this is a ranking. She doesn't want to be with this guy. She wants to be with this guy, but if she can't be with this guy, this is who she'd like to be with. He doesn't show up. He shows up intoxicated. He's rude. He doesn't wash. You know, those are the kinds of things that that would be the second type of person that she'd want to be with. The third type of person she wants to be with is a police officer, an undercover police officer that's going to arrest her for pandering or for uh, prostitution. And the last person that she would want to meet with is a violent male, right? Because he's going to be violent towards her. And that's probably the ranking, right? And the problem is, before the internet, all four of those guys look exactly the same. Right? They can say that they're not a police officer. They can say they're going to show up on time. They can say they're not violent. That's exactly what a police officer says. He's going to say the same thing. That's exactly what a violent male is going to say. He's going to say he's not violent. So how is the internet going to help her figure out who these people are and then sort of sort into those relationships better? All right. Well, it's going to do it through... One, is, one of the main ways it's going to do it is it's going to do it through an elaborate system of screening and signaling. All right, so one is that uh, she can email him. Right? With Craigslist, she gets an anonymous email address. She contacts him. She just has a little time. She has a little time to talk to him, ask him some questions. Maybe she just feels a little better. You know? Secondly, she could call him at work. That's a trick they like to do. That scares the client. How did you call me at work? How did you even get this number? Right? And in a way, it sort of signals that uh, you know, she knows where he is. And if anything was to happen to her, other people might know. Right? Then she might do some actual using of the tools of the internet, which, you know, uh, people are very good at using the internet to learn a lot about men in particular. So she could do background checks. She could use Google. There's all kinds of services she could subscribe to. But the most interesting thing to me as an economist has been the rise of these lists. So what I, in my survey that I did, I found that 60% of internet-based sex workers used a letter of reference system. Before they would meet with a new client, they will require that new client to give the contact information of two or more sex workers that he's had sex with. She'll then go contact those sex workers. She'll read her reviews. She'll read the names of the men that are reviewing her. She'll check who else they reviewed. She goes through this whole search, this recursive search. She thinks it helps her. Right? It's an empirical question if it's working. Right, but she believes it's helping her. Or there have been the growth in whitelists. The Erotic Review opened up a service called the Whitelist. And it was basically a group of men that they've already screened. You don't have to screen them. And there's the Blacklist, which is exactly what you think it is. Just a circulated spreadsheet of bad actors. Right? All of this stuff sort of showed up with the internet, but it needed these platforms in order for it to do anything. It wasn't just enough to have a website. And Craigslist is the first platform. It's of the advertising sections. It is the first advertising platform. Okay? Is, is there anything like this for drug dealing? There's, uh, yeah, so there was uh, Silk Road. Silk Road was the closest proxy. Cl Silk Road had all of this. 
Silk Road had a um, reputation system. Um, it did not have a whitelist, but it did have a reputation system. It had an escrow system to uh, make the transactions be simultaneous. So there was certain things like that. The government highly prioritized busting Silk Road. And uh, I wonder if Silk Road, I mean, Silk Road was on the dark web. Probably, I don't know. Probably it's not protected by CDA, but like, yeah. So it, it was shut down. Another one opened, Silk Road 2. It got shut down. Silk Road 3 got shut down. There's always these Silk Roads all over the, all over Torrent, um, the Tor network. But uh, I don't think Craigslist was being used for it. Um, I don't think a section of Craigslist ever opened up to facilitate illicit drug exchanges. Um, you do have like weed map and stuff like that. So you do have things that where there's information being brought out, but I don't think anything quite, I don't know of anything like this in drugs. Although you would think that there would be. So this was an, uh, a, a book that Amanda Bass, or this is an article Amanda Bass wrote. She's a journalist at West Virginia. This is just anecdotal, just so that you know that I'm not just making all this stuff. This is like in the air. She wrote, having the, so this was based on extensive interviews with sex workers. She says, having the ability to advertise online allows sex workers to more carefully screen potential customers and work indoors. Research shows, research shows, I have no idea what she's talking about. Research shows that when sex workers can't advertise online and screen clients, they are often forced onto the street where it is more difficult to screen out violent clients and negotiate safe sex, i.e. sex with condoms. They are also more likely to have to depend on exploitive pimps for to find customers. All right, so that's the theory. That is, an un that is a testable hypothesis that you know, Amanda Bast is, has only evidence for from speaking with living sex workers, a select sample of a select sample, okay? All right, so this is New York City. This is like the second Craigslist. The, it was called Craigslist because Craig Newmark created a list at the very beginnings of the internet, 95, and he would just circulate an email list of like things in the Bay Area. You know, it was just like Craig's list. It got popular and he started rolling out, the CEO started rolling out clones of a new list. And this was like the second list. So now the list is, uh, got some information. You can see here there's women seeking men, women seeking women, men seeking women, men seeking men. My favorite, missed connections, real tragedy of FOSTA. Craigslist got so paranoid they shut down missed connections. Missed connections is like a beautiful piece of, of, of literature uh, that is now gone. And uh, you can see right here, but none of these are sex work. These are all hookup stuff. And then you have over here services. Now look, there's only three services. Resumes, freelance, small business ads. Services was basically like a miscellaneous section. You know, it was just kind of catching everything else. This is web Craigslist 3.0. So this is Dallas, Fort Worth. Look, so there was only three services. Now there's 14. And look, they have nothing to do with each other, right? You've got computer, creative, erotic, event, legal, therapeutic, real estate, skilled trade. These are services that have nothing in common with each other, okay? Now, erotic services was legitimate. It was escorts, which, you know, it has plausibly is not sex work. So it's just simply having, paying someone for a date and what they, what they decide to do later is their business. Um, that's what the cover is for the escort system and um, dancers. But it got immediately captured by sex workers instantly. I mean, openly it was listing menus of prices of, for specific sex acts. It was uh, showing very suggestive digital photographs, you know. So this was immediately captured by the illicit market and it no longer becomes a place for uh, dancers or anything like that. It's sex work. Now it opens in 400 cities in our sample and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second, but this is 1995 and the hollow circles mean they don't have neurotic services. In April 03, the Bay Area has one and for some reason Houston has one. Um, January 04, it starts to spread out. 05, 06, 09. So I did like a, sur uh, a survivor analysis where I just was trying to figure out of the month city level data that I had access to, what actually predicts them opening and erotic services. The main predictors are distance to the Bay Area and the population of the city. 
Crime, murder does not predict it. Murder has nothing to do with, and I'll show you that with the event study too. There doesn't appear to be any predictive power with the, you know, the, the lag average, you know, murder rates for women in the previous period. All right, so let me tell you about the data. So to get the, the, the sample, what I did first was, I'll start with this one, I used the Supplemental Homicide Reports 1995 to 09. What's nice about the SHR is uh, the SHR provides information about the identity of the victim. It also provides information on the identity of the offender and the relationship she has with the offender, but I don't get to use that because it doesn't really make sense for this project. But I am able to say that she's a woman. I am able to know that she's a female. I limit it to just cities that have 100,000 people because murder is very rare. So I just am going to limit it to cities that have on average 100,000 people over 95 to 09. That gives me about 400 cities. And then for, for the rest of the analysis, I use the 400 cities. So the first is I have to figure out, well, when are these dates? When does this happen? So what I did was I went to the Wayback Machine and the Wayback Machine is basically an archival system where the internet is being archived. Every website is being stored on like a daily or monthly or weekly basis. And so uh, the Wayback Machine has the complete history of Craigslist. Now, see, I'm not looking at the opening of Craigslist. I'm looking at the opening of the erotic services. So what I basically did was I look in each month and so long as it has this page right here, it has not been treated. But in the first month where it shows this page, and I see erotic services, in that month they were treated. Okay, so I get all the treatment dates for the 400 cities. Um, then I, I'm going to be using the supplemental homicide reports for my homicide data. And then I'm going to be using this data, the erotic review that I scraped. So I'll tell you a little bit about the erotic review, and I'm also going to use for one robustness check manslaughters, which I get from the part one uniform crime reports. Did the, did the regular sort of the, 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 the sections on man seeking women for dating or sexual yeah. relationships, did that similarly roll, did that roll out? Yeah, that rolled out too. Actually, so I can share you with you that data. Me and uh, uh, Melanie Goldie and Christine Durrance have been analyzing the, the hookup. Because what's nice about that is, whereas most of the hookup apps are digital apps that show up at the app store instantaneously, there was actually geographic rollout with this. You know, so it's not, you know, it's not tender, you know, but it was an early internet platform for matching people looking for casual encounters. And how does it how does it relate to the here's a lot of erotic services? Well, you can see here it shows up before erotic services, and then at the end of the sample they show up at the same time. So, like basically, there's uh, there's this Bay Area one, which is the Craigslist 1.0. Then there is then there is this one, which is rolling out, and it rolls out early. Craigslist enters a lot of cities pretty quickly, but then it update, it refreshes at different points in time, and it refreshes at about 40 different times in different. Well, yeah, it refreshes in different cities at different. I don't know why they do it. I Craig Newmark follows me on Twitter, and uh, he, you know, for reasons that are obvious, he really likes this paper, and uh, so I I direct message at him, and I was just like, hey, you know, just out of curiosity. Why are you opening erotic services in different cities at different points in time? And he's like, that was a complicated, well, he said, he said, uh, that was a complicated marketing decision, which was totally unhelpful. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I don't think anybody knows why erotic services is opening in these cities. You know, I, all I can really point to is, first of all, to Joe's question, it is following the opening of the hookup stuff. And in the, at the end, it's simultaneous. And the only other thing I'd point out is that it's one of 14, you know? So it, it's not, I, he didn't tell me why they're opening, but I don't think he's looking at female homicide rates when he's thinking about opening, but that's not really the only way you can make something endogenous, right? Uh, it could be there's some other third unknown variable that's correlated with homicide, it's correlated with the opening and, you know, and I don't know what it is, and he won't tell me because it's a complicated marketing situation. So I'm going to do my best to sort of look at potential confounders. But obviously, you know, differences and differences have certain built-in assumptions, and they may not hold. 
Okay, so the Erotic Review is a reputation website where clients review sex workers. It was extremely popular. I call it an institution um, because it was creating reputations for these women and those reputations were probably enforcing some of these informal contracts. Um, sex workers significantly valued their reputation. They got a bad review. They would the business shut down. For them. So it was very important to them uh, to use it. And in tr April 2017, I scraped 1.4 million reviews on hundreds of thousands of unique providers. So it was a really big website. Um, now, the Supplemental Homicide Reports actually does say whether the sex worker, whether the victim was a sex worker, prostitute, but experts in criminology that have studied it said that because of the way the identity of the offender is recorded in the report, it will systematically understate a prostitute murder, and this is why. The monthly reporting schedule for participating agencies requires agencies to report the homicide in the month that they were discovered, even if that is not the month in which they occurred, or if the social context is not yet known. So that means if Joe is a detective, and he finds a woman's body, and he doesn't know who the offender is, he has to report to the SHR that that is the month in which the body was found, and if in six months he finds that it was a sex worker, he cannot update it. So sex worker homicides go unreported for months. I, that she's a sex worker could go run, can go unreported forever. So there's this built-in under-ascertainment bias SHR. There's hardly any prostitution or homicides listed in the SHR. And we know from other we know from administrative data from the police that that's not true. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the total female homicide rate, which will add noise to our estimates. Okay? All right, so now we're going to look at the first stage of the, it's not, this is not an IV paper, but I just wanted to see if there's any evidence that erotic services is doing anything, right? Because if you don't find any evidence that erotic services is doing anything, then you definitely shouldn't see, believe my results if you believed them in the first place. So uh, what's nice, so this is the front page of the uh, erotic review of a particular provider. This is T.S. Christine. I think it means she's transsexual. Transsexual Christine. This is the information. These are static fields. And what he does is he puts in information here. So he types in a URL, types in an email address. This is a menu button. He'll pull down some stuff. He'll put yes or no after all these things. And then he'll put in some appearance stuff. And then there's more things you have to be a, a VIP member to access here. But what, look, I want to bring your attention to this right here. There is this email section, right? So he's going to fill out her email address. And look at transsexual Christine. He reported her Craigslist email address. Now, see, what's funny is that that's not a real email address. That thing's going to disappear in a couple of days. But he doesn't know better. He doesn't know who she is. She's only using, he met her through Craigslist. And he reported her Craigslist email address. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do an event study and we're going to see if when erotic services enters in the city, like here's Revere, Massachusetts, in the city, are those pseudonym Craigslist email addresses being used? And here's what's interesting. Even before erotic services, when there was a hookup part to the site, it was not being used for sex work. At least it wasn't being used to review women at the erotic review, okay? There's no mention of Craigslist whatsoever before erotic services enter. This is a recentered months prior to treatment. And then about 10 months after erotic services portals open in the city, you start seeing people being listed with a Craigslist email address at the erotic review, okay? So it does look like the site is doing something because even at this unrelated website, you're seeing these women show up, their email addresses. The second thing you see here is there's this menu button, menu or radio bar or whatever they call it, where uh, you click on agency and there's three buttons. You can either say uh, she works for an agency, which means she works for an escort agency. You could say that she's independent, which means she doesn't work for an agency. That's what it means, doesn't work for an agency. Um, or a driver, because the third option is she works with, with a driver. Now drivers are very rare. Part of this, only about 2.7% of these button are drivers. Uh, most of them are either agencies or independents. Now here's what, I, here's what I can say. Independent 
is uh, not overlapping with agency. You can't work at both. Okay. That said, I have no idea where a pimp would go. If she works for a pimp, she technically doesn't work for an agency. She's technically not independent either. Okay. So I don't know what that means. I just know she can only be filled out as an independent, an agency, or a driver. And I just want to show you how the website changes as erotic services enters. All right, so you can see here at the beginning, erotic review, the review website, was selecting really intensively on independent sex workers. Those were the early adopters, independent sex workers. But over time, the agencies learned about it, and the agencies are using the erotic review until Erotic Services opens in the city, and about 10 months later, it takes a little time, but it completely reverses trend. Right? And by the end, you've got 65% of the erotic review is independent, which that's, not, that's almost about what it was like at the beginning. Right? So completely changed the composition of the... Se well, let me, let, me, let me back up. The composition of the erotic review is different after the after erotic services causal okay putting that I have no counterfactual here so it's just before and after maybe um, so what's kind of the the window of treatment rollout you're looking at like how many months between say the first San Francisco cluster to when you have basically kind of widespread adoption um, are you asking me about what the lag is going to be well I'm just curious like the, say like how many months between like the first time you see erotic services, like your first kind of treatment <coughs> group till your last treatment group? Well, the first one's going to be 02, okay. and then everybody has it by 09. Okay. And there's about 40 different treatment dates between 02 and 09. I go back to 95 because that is the beginning of Craigslist. Mm -hmm. But most of my action is going to come from the 02 to 09. I mean, all of my action is coming from the 02 to 09 period. So looking at this graph then, yeah. does this make you think that there's that the adoption of erotic services is, is somehow correlated with trends in the sex worker market given that you know you have yeah. you know where it's not you know you've got a pretty wide Trend that's dropping yeah. down. Right. But the fact that that trend is going to be happening at different times in different places, yeah. does that tell you that maybe there was something happening to the sex worker market? Or what would I, well, I don't know if this tells me that. Um, this is just saying, well, okay, yeah, this is showing downward trends, mm -hmm. right? Because you can see it's systematically correlated with the recentering of the date. So definitely they're entering markets where the erotic review is becoming increasingly dependent on agencies posting reviews. Right? You can see it more and more because the independents are disappearing. Whether or not that's a change in the market, I don't know, but it's definitely a change at the erotic review. So it's not that the erotic review was just this following some constant. It was, so what happens, it, yeah, so in that sense, it's definitely associated with a, with a change in the composition at the erotic review. Yeah. yeah. The x-axis minus 50-50 are those months? Yeah, months. Yeah. And you can see here the opposite. Uh, what you've got is, you know, just a plummeting of the number of, of the percent. That, that's important. It's not, the, it's not the number. It's the, it's the percent of the website. So the website's getting bigger. Right? It's, but it's selecting after erotic services enters, the marginal sex worker is an independent sex worker. That's the main finding, and I show that with regressions too. But you know, the marginal sex worker is a independent. Okay. So this is going to be my linear panel model, um, OLS and Poisson, as well as event studies. But they're all going to follow basically this format. Uh, I'm going to have a dummy for the first ten months, and I'll show you different specifications for that. And then I'm going to have a long-term dummy, right? And this happens because. You can see in the erotic review the delaying. It doesn't happen instantly. It takes a little time. Uh, it's going to be total female homicide rates and other outcomes. Uh, XMMT basically is going to have city population. I have month, city, 
and uh, I'd only was able to get city population. City fixed effects, year fixed effects, month fixed effects, month year fixed effects, state year fixed effects. So this is gonna be implicitly forcing the counterfactual to come from within the state, okay? Standard errors are gonna be clustered by the city. Threat to identification, I'll say it in two different ways. Uh, one is, you know, uh, the parallel trends assumption may not hold, right? That's sort of every time you do a differences in differences design, you're saying absent erotic services, female homicide rates would have evolved similarly in the treatment units as they did in the control units, right? So that, that is one way to express it. Um, the other way to express it is just to say, is entry endogenous to female homicide rates? Do I have strict exogeneity? Okay, all right. So obviously these are not testable, not directly testable. The parallel trends assumption is a counterfactual assumption. So that's not testable. But there's some auxiliary tests that we tend to do that I like a lot that we'll look at, okay? So here's my results. So you can see right here, this is the OLS regressions and this is the Poisson regressions. Here you can see the big effects. So when I have just city fixed effects, month year fixed effects, I find a negative 0.019 under a mean of 0.13. Uh, when I put in the state year fixed effects, it goes to 0.015. When I put in population, the p-value gets to be about a 0.06, and it's a negative 0.013 off of mean of 0.13. So there's the 10 percentage point decline that I'm getting. Uh, when, I do points, when I do Poisson, these are semi-elasticity, 19%, 13%, 12%. You can sort of see the, the size here of how big these are. And I, the, si the, the effect sizes are, are, are large. They are large. Um, so then I do an event study. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the leads and I'm going to look at the lags. Right? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put all, I, actually on Twitter, I've been learning a lot listening to these people that have, are better at diff and diff than me. Um, and there's different philosophies on how you're supposed to handle these leads because some places are getting, you know, uh, they're getting 75 months pretreatment, but the Bay Area wasn't. And so what I've done is some people will show all the leads. What I've done is what appears to be uh, suggested, which is to bunch the leads at the, be at the beginning so that it looks balanced. And you can see right here, three of the five coefficients, these are in basically 10 month you know, combined leads. Three of the five are zeros with large standard errors. This one's bigger, 0.021 but it's not statistically significant. That's 0.011, not statistically significant. Now you can see right here, there's that 10 month dummy, which we find no effects on. Here's why, because there's no effect in the first, month, first 10 months. But then after 10 to 19, it starts to slip down and it remains statistically significant. And the joint, you know, the, the, the lags are, jointly, are highly significant and the leads are not, they're not jointly significant. I make a big deal about this. Uh, I am a stickler for this. This is not a test of the parallel trends assumption at all. People oftentimes act like it is because they have a very naive understanding of diff and diff. This is just simply seeing if it's entering cities in ways that are systematically correlated with this particular decline. But the parallel trends assumption is all about this stuff and it's not testable. Okay, so, to really, so it's, I, I emphasize this to my students is that this is the lazy man's way of trying to provide evidence for the parallel trends assumption. You should be doing a lot more than that. Okay, so I try to show a little bit more. So first what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show that I haven't just picked a, the one window that gives me the effect. It's a long run trend, right? Whether it's six months, nine months, or 12 months, all right? you're always finding the effects are in, dominated by the long run reductions. It's this stuff, okay? That's what's killing, that's what's doing it. And what I also do that I find personally compelling, and I guess I, un, until I learn, you know, a little bit more about, some, maybe I learn something about randomization inference that's gonna make me uh, realize it's not as compelling. But what I did was uh, I randomized, so I've got these cities that have uh, treatment dates that I got from the Wayback Machine. Maybe it's, maybe I am finding this, but you know, these standard errors are based on these, you know, uh, um, asymptotic properties that may not hold, 
right? They're not samples. They're the universe of homicides. So, you know, or there may be reasons you don't like that. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to get exact p-values under this fisher sharp null, right? And what I'm going to do is there's two ways that you could do this randomization. You could either randomize the treatment dates within the city. So the Bay Area gets it in 02. Let's assume the Bay Area gets it in 07 and you randomize it horizontally. I'm going to randomize it vertically. And I've been thinking in the car, why do I do it that way? I, I like it. That's, that's why I did it that way. Um, I don't know. I don't really have it. That one to me seems like the appropriate sharp null is like there is no treatment. There is no treatment for that period of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to randomize with a thousand draws when cities get uh, the treatment. And I'm going to say like Bay Area is going to get Dallas's treatment. Houston's going to get New York's treatment. So I'm going to do that a thousand different times. I'm going to estimate this model, this one, just this one because Poisson wouldn't converge. So I'm going to do just this one. All right. So my, my main effect is going to be a negative 0.13, and I'm just going to see, I'm going to get a distribution of those 1,000 coefficients off of the placebos, and I'm going to see where 0.13 fits in the distribution. Then I get an exact p-value, which is just a rank order of the true effect, divided by its position, divided by 1,000, and I get nothing in the first 10 months, and I get a negative 0.13 with a p-value of 0.08, which it says what? What does that tell me? Here's all that it tells me. There is something unusual about the date that erotic services opens, right? There is something that it's not just simply, it's not drawn from the, it's not drawn from the placebo distribution. I mean, it, at eight, there's an 8% chance it could come from the placebo, right? So there's something original. There's something novel about the Wayback Machine's dating, right? I also do this matrix completion method. Um, you can think about with the potential outcomes framework. They always talk about causal effects as a missing date problem. So, you know, if I want to know what was the effect of going uh, of Joe getting a PhD in economics versus had he gotten a PhD in sociology, that's a missing data problem because I don't know what his P his wages would have been had he gotten a PhD in sociology, right? And if that's the causal, if that's the counterfactual, and I got to know the counterfactual, then I can never really know under that potential outcomes framework. So what you're going to do with uh, the matrix completion for panel data is you've got all of these. You've got all of these observed homicide rates in particular periods of time, and then we're going to estimate what the, counterfa what the missing matrix of counterfactuals would have been using their lasso, but it's actually a minimizing a nuclear norm. It's like lasso, but uh, the norm is different. And uh, it's going to lead to a low rank matrix that is computationally feasible. So this is the lasso. Here you sort of see the, it's not lasso, but here's the regularization that you're doing right here. It's the nuclear norm, uh, which is going to be the sum of singular values of Z. It's basically chosen using tenfold cross validation using the MC panel package, which has been built into this G synth package. Standard errors come from bootstrapping, same thing. F effects are actually larger, right? They're actually two times bigger, negative 023, and more precise. So this is where the 17.6% comes from, because uh, given a mean rate of 0 .13, this is a 17% reduction, right? I keep finding these big effects. Either effects are too small or they're too big. That's like your whole, your career is going to be basically on somebody saying one of the two. Um, so then what I've done instead, you know, so what I prefer with, um, rather than just simply relying on event studies, I really like falsifications. That's what I, think of a specific hypothesis that explains your results that also makes other predictions and tests those other predictions. That to me is very compelling if you have a very good counter hypothesis. So I'm just going to say, well, maybe Craigslist is just entering cities and for some unknown confounder that is reducing violence. Right? Just reducing violence, it's the business cycle, it's income, it's demographics, it's something like that. If it's just reducing violence, then I should see it in these other measures of violence. I should see it in uh, intimate partner homicides. I should see it definitely in male homicides. I should see it in manslaughters. And I don't. I don't find any effect. Now, the, the standard errors are big. right? On this one, it's small. Standard errors are big here once I put in 
uh, once I use Poisson, uh, and here the, you know, I can't rule out large effects, but uh, I find nothing statistically significant on manslaughter. That's a zero. That's a zero. That's close. That's closer. You know, that's still. I don't know what the. That's a mean of 0.5. So that's actually really small zeros. And then the Poissons are giving me big ones. But nothing statistically significant. Nothing statistically significant. And these are actually positive and positive. Yeah. So the, so, so the devil's advocate, right? It's yeah. Quote, is the is the the Poisson? If you if you really thought there could be no spillovers to to, to male homicides, mm -hmm. because we don't think erotic, we don't think male prosecutors, uh, or clients, or so, or somebody's being helped by yeah, it. We don't think that. So that that would take it down to closer to six and a half percent relative to mm -hmm. Poisson. Have you seen how sensitive that is to, to a full set of, 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 of county by month or year fixed effects with the triple difference? I got the no. What would be the what would be the oh I mean, against the man, woman? Guess, put yeah, put the woman in there. Man and just sort of see. So, uh, yeah. I think it was 0.124 was right. the estimate post ten months for, for, for women and there's yeah. you know, five seven. So that's about I that. haven't done a triple diff. Okay. Yeah yeah yeah. That would be interesting. Because I guess I would be trying to figure, so I have a negative 0.13, I got a negative 0.23 here. So you could reverse it, make it positive. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a good, I haven't done that. There's a direct diff and diff falsification. So mechanisms. Um, uh, so we do not have, surprise, surprise, I do not have a panel of street walkers. The census doesn't collect that information. So uh, all I can do is I, you know, and I think that this is true, barring somebody having very good city level, month level data uh, that you could match up with the erotic services rollout. Um, I don't have uh, reliable data on street workers, but I have, do have data from the erotic review. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is I, my, my main mechanism that I'm going to focus on here. Well, there's two. There's two mechanisms I'm going to focus on here. First is I'm going to focus on the street prostitution mechanism. Second, I'm going to focus on the screening mechanism. Now, the only way I think that I can really get at the street prostitution mechanism using a website of reviews is I'm going to look for the word street to appear in the, the reviews. Okay, so they write the review. If the word street is in there, I can pull it out. Right? So I'm going to have, the, I'm gonna have a, a, a count for the number of times street appears. And I'm going to get prices, appearance, and performance. Now, this is a room full of economists, so I'm going to say one thing, and then I'm going to back up and say another thing. But first, I'm just going to say sex workers have lower prices. All right? Now, Craigslist is shifting supply and demand. So it's not clear what a change in price is going to mean. But I, I am just going to say street walkers systematically have lower prices. You can see that in lots of different studies that kind of compare. They also appear to be less attractive and they appear to be less professional. So if there is, uh, with the erotic services, street walkers moving indoors, then I should see reductions in the word street because they're not street workers anymore. And I should see lower prices and lower appearance and lower performance. That would be consistent with this negative selection story. Street walkers moving indoors, marginal sex worker is a street walker. That word street should stop appearing or it should decrease because she's not a street prostitute anymore. And, but she is a counterfactual street prostitute, so her prices, appearance, and performance score should be lower. All right, and that would give us some evidence that women are moving indoors. And then um, I'm going to check this screening mechanism. And so here's how I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm going to mine the textual reviews for the word reference, background check, and a bunch of other known language like websites that do these screening, the white lists and things. I'm going to see if that appears in there. Now, here's the problem. The problem is you only observe matches that overcame the screening in the first place. Okay. So this is already like selecting on the dependent variable to even be looking at that kind of thing. Uh, and then secondly, men may not know they were screened in the first place. If they got a reference letter, they may not report it. If she did a background check, he's not going to know that. You're not going to see anybody that was rejected. So it's possible that this may not even ever give us any information, but I look at it anyway. All right, so here's a summary of what I'm going to find. I find no effects on being screened. The word screening and any of that stuff does not change systematically with erotic services entering in a city. But I do find evidence that 
could be interpreted as streetwalkers uh, entering the online market. And here's what. The Luxon performance scores declined slightly. Now it's not big. It's 0.13 and 0.11 on a 10 point scale. So it's small reductions but they are getting lower scores. The marginal sex worker after erotic services enters is getting lower professional and appearance scores. The word street falls 15% below the mean. So, these, so the word street is disappearing right, with erotic services opening in the city and prices fall by 5%. Not prices. The price of the sex worker, the, wa the wage of the sex worker. That she has a menu of prices that she, you know, to meet with her, it's These gonna are cost. prices that were advertised on Craigslist? Yeah, no, no, they're advertised on the erotic review. So you got Craigslist and you have the erotic review. And now the data is over here with the erotic review matched with the Craigslist entry date. And you can see that when Craigslist enters, the average price or the marginal price falls by $15, which is a 5% <laughs> reduction. Now it could be just shifts in supply and demand. Some unknown weird shifts in spine and demand. But I bring it to your attention because it is at least consistent with negative selection. Do you have any useful information on the men that would indicate like the average quality? Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. Uh, erotic services is probably going to bring in new men, bring in new reviewers, right? And so it's not correct just to treat this one sided thing. But ultimately, like erotic services enter and the equilibrium at erotic could be because men change, could be because women change, could be because women are moving indoors, could be some sort of shift in supply and demand, could be, who knows, right? Average total cost fell, prices fell to the bottom of average total cost. So I don't have good information on the men. They, that's, that's the thing, at the erotic review, you just have their handle. Yeah. It's all you have. Now, aren't there some characters of the cities that you could capture in your data that would correlate with the uh, relative importance of street workers versus other kinds of prostitutes. For example, if the city has an active downtown versus a city that's mostly suburbia, that would, you know, I would think that it would be easier to yeah. have a concentration of street workers where there is a downtown. So maybe so like get some you, kind of city find, level. Can you find that? your effect would be stronger yeah. in the cities that have a downtown. Proxy, by like some sort of interaction of erotic services with like a city dummy or something. That's good. No, I haven't done that. I haven't done that. Um, that's very feasible. That's totally feasible. Yeah, some kind of city level measure. I, maybe there's a way to construct an index. Maybe I look at the word street at the beginning of the sample or something or well, yeah I, I can figure urban, out something urban economists yeah they, they have all kinds of things about whether there's a downtown whether there's a downtown or just you know like maybe use nibers to get street prostitution arrests or something like that you do, like, you mean just density density yeah yeah just to continue to build the case that the or just to continue to explore whether the street mechanism is plausible mm -hmm. right so um, Related to the screening mechanism, you yeah. can't sort of find any evidence for here. Yeah. I'm wondering if you, and this might be like a far fetched hypothesis, but I'm wondering if the sort of screening is screening out the bad guys, right? Because yeah. it would potentially be committing a homicide. Yeah. Or not showing up, or being police officers. Um, well, I guess the, because you're trying to understand the mechanism yeah. by which homicides are. Right. So that's like yeah, so it's got to be screening out the bad guys. Exactly. So, I'm wondering if you can look at local like sexual assault rates yeah. um, as the outcome variable around here and see if there's any type of like violent sexual spillover yeah. around this that would indicate that these bad guys are seeking sexual services. Yeah. They're denied through this through the screening process. Yeah. And then there's some sort of outlet somewhere else. So I looked at rapes and I found when I did rapes uh, this event study looked very similar to the rapes, but the bars always covered find strong, significant reductions, significant, statistically significant evidence for reductions in rapes. But if you looked at it, it was zeros. 
it just was never statistically significant in the in any individually lag or you know for the average Diddy. So I could I tried that. I've taken it out of the paper because the paper got so large. Um, and then, uh, but I could look at the use the Uniform Crime Reports Part Two and get. I think you can get sexual assault arrests. You could get arrests. You can't get offenses or incidents, but you can get arrests. So I could look at that um, and just try to s explore this mechanism of like this safety valve or however you want to think about this substitution effect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's so the rape results are kind of interesting but imprecise, but the sexual assault would be interesting. So uh, I'm wondering if there, uh, in addition to the uh, city size and other other factors that you account for in the like the geographical yeah. Right. Do you consider any political barriers? Like, is it Democratic or Republican stronghold? Well, I soak all that stuff up with the city fixed effects and the state. Year. I mean, I city fixed effects over a 15 year period of time is not going to soak that up. But um, I got state year fi state year fixed effects would get you political things at the state year level, but not at this time. So no, I haven't. I haven't looked at political. And uh, I guess just also the permissiveness of, of policing. Uh, there's some cities that may be enforcing more um, uh, sex working uh, crimes, yeah. and others that don't. And I don't know. I mean, it may be by chance that just the way this was staggered yeah. was not predicted on that, but just by chance. By chance. What would I? So what would be the outcome that you would be that would be convincing? For um, I, I guess like arrests, like uh, related to prostitution or soliciting. Yeah, but see, prostitution arrests should be falling if they're moving indoors. That's the thing is because because it has made it more difficult for the police officer to get through these screens. Prostitution arrests should be falling. I was I was just thinking prior to treatment. Well, like oh, whether or not it predicted that. entry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. Predicted. So in more of the survivor analysis. Yes. More of the survivor analysis. Yeah, maybe that's what's missing. Maybe you're not terribly convinced by Craig Newmark telling me it's a complicated marketing decision. I, I that was, I <laughs> was there any decision making that actually was kind of like negotiating yep. entry with the cities? I no, they don't. They don't negotiate anything with the cities. Okay. Yeah, 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 they don't even do any advertising in the cities. Nobody even knows it's coming. No advertising, no announcement. They don't have to. They don't have to do anything. Uh, I was just wondering, and I guess your state year fixed effects are going to pick up a decent amount of this. Yeah. But this is also, you know, towards the end of your treatment samples when the recession is happening, the yeah. financial crisis is going on. Wouldn't this also be expected to have a big positive supply shock for sex workers? Yes. That are going into this industry? Should so increase supply, increase should decrease demand. And so they have all this whole group of very inexperienced people that are coming in yeah. that don't necessarily have the ability to just know how to screen help. Yeah. You know, they're not aware of doing all these like 20 different background checks that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Uh, if anything, this I think is actually a support your result of you know when this comes in, the, the crime rates. Yeah, I mean uh, that's where the sort of confounding thing, and there is a little bit of variation from city to city. Yeah. In terms of how deeply unemployment is affected by. Yeah. Say your fixed effects is a way of handling those kinds of regional shocks. You know, um, uh, I do not disagree. I completely agree with you that the the that the supply is. I can't remember remember if cyclical means it goes with the cycle, but like. Uh, I think that supply is going to increase during a recession and demand is going to decrease through those income income effects. So, you know, uh, yeah. huh? Yeah. yeah, I mean, th these guys are unemployed. They don't have as much money. Yeah. So, uh, the, yes, yeah, so towards the end of the site, so towards the end of the panel, yeah, there's a cut. There's the 01 recession. There's the, uh, there's the dot com recession, the 9 11 recession the 08 recession in here. That's at the end of the sample. It'll be because of the way diff and diff calculates the weights, that should be be relatively a small weight because it happens at the end. It's usually the things in the middle of the treatment period that are weighting up the weights. But um, yeah, that's a good point. There's actually another possibility though that way that this could work. It could be that the business has gotten so good that she can work with regular clients and turn away business. And I do find evidence for that. Uh, 
the probability, because I again mine the data for the word regular, and the probability of being a repeat customer goes up two to three percent, and her in calls are rising nine percent. In calls means the guy comes to her place, which is very risky. So what you are seeing, so even though I can't get evidence of screening, it's interesting what I'm getting here is some proxies for trust, right? So like you are getting that he's, see, because the safest worker is the, the one that's irregular. He's already been screened. He's lower cost in terms of, of being worried about him, but he's actually even lower cost in terms of the work itself. Having any familiarity with the guy just makes it less unpleasant. Okay, so you've got this increased repeat customer stuff. It's probably happening because of the thickening and the sorting, and she's bringing them into her home. So even though I can't get the screening, it's interesting that I am getting evidence of safer behaviors, trust-like behaviors. Um, when you're going back to the erotic review, when you're going and like seeing when the ERS actually hits. Yeah. Are you able to like go back and see if there's new posters after that? So you could have guys that were afraid to go and pick them up off the street with like you would take away that mention of street and the guys weren't I'm not gonna go grab my car. Exactly. Go, where you, you watch those dates and you can say like the increase of population of people posting. Well, I mean this is the lamest answer to that. It's just really complicated to work with the <laughs> the emails. Uh, the the i am I'm not very good with like real regular expressions. So like and to analyze like the demand side, the writers, I haven't really known how to use it. So I don't know if there's an increase. So like one thing I could do to test your question is what's the probability of seeing a first time reviewer, right? That would be a, like an email that has never, or a handle that has never been used before. That would be a nice thing to do. If I found that, you know, maybe I'm finding that these new guys that are entering the market are just not your typical clients. All of which might help tell the story about this compositional change. But yeah, I have not done that. Um, I could do that, I haven't done it. Um, so, discussion, so it, to get a, ten, so sorry to rush through, Joe just told me I had two minutes. So, uh, a 10% reduction in female homicide, how big is that? Right, let's say it's true, let's say it's true. It's 175 fewer female homicides a year times eight years, that's 1,400 homicides. Uh, Bill Evans and Emily Owens estimated a police crime elasticity of negative, uh, eight, negative 0.84. To get 1,400 fewer homicides over an eight year period, you would need 120,000 additional police officers. If they each make $100,000, that's a $12 billion <laughs> expenditure. Uh, so if this is true, if this is true. So erotic services required no working with the local legislators, requires no political processes all. They just opened up the platform. They get it. Well, I don't know the cost, but the outlays are zero. You know, or the outlays were just, it's a clone of a website, so the marginal cost didn't mean very high. So in April 2018, Trump passes overwhelmingly popular Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, and it says whoever owns, manages, or operates an interactive computer service or conspires or attempts to do so with the intent to promote or facilitate prostitution shall be imprisoned, uh, shall be fined under this title, imprisoned by no more than 10 years. Uh, widespread disruption, websites closed, DOJ seizes back page. What has been the effect? We don't know the effect, so these are just anecdotes. Um, Lieutenant Jimmy Sides of the San Antonio Police told the Associated Press. I have seen a group of fresher faces, so that would make me think they're new to the street, maybe from the internet. Police are reporting increased presence of street prostitution, period, that they haven't seen in decades. Sergeant John Daggy, undercover police officer in Indianapolis, told journalists, with Backpage, we would subpoena the ads, and it would tell a lot of the story. With the ads, we would catch our victim at a hotel room, gives us a crime scene, tons of evidence at a crime scene. Now Backpage is gone and we're getting late reports and we don't have much to go by. So uh, they've got this disruption in their policing that they're reporting. And uh, there's been numerous reports, anecdotal, of violence against sex workers and recruitment by pimps and traffickers. So uh, can the internet disrupt violent crime? Uh, maybe. 
If so, why? Is it going to be screening? Could it be movement indoors? Could it be substitution, this pacification type of thing? Potentially. The, the evidence that we find most strong is for indirect evidence for trust, the, word, the evidence that street workers are moving indoors. Those are the things that I feel like I can actually support. There could be some potentially unintended consequences of shutting down these websites. Increased risks to vulnerable participants could occur, namely female prostitutes. It's an open empirical question. Someone should study it. That would be a very important research project to figure out what FOSTA did. I don't think it's going to be me, but all right, and that's it. Okay. Do you have any questions? <laughs>